Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, this morning I spoke about osteoporosis as an orphan disease. A long time ago, we thought that this disease has nobody to look after its patients and its sufferers. It has been handled by many disciplines of medicine. But over the last 25 years, we are speaking now about osteoporosis that we can predict very early and we can treat at the same time. And the reason for that, that we have, as Professor Omar has shown us, we have new techniques, and these new techniques, we can measure the BMD very early. At the same time, we can assess the fracture risk because the end point of osteoporosis, which is a silent disease, is a fracture. We have tools now to predict which patient is going to develop a fracture within the next 10 years. And we have an armamentarium of drugs. We have many drugs now. In the past, we used only calcium and vitamin D. Now we have many anti-resorptive drugs. We have drugs that build up bones, and the best thing to do is to identify which patient needs which drug. Now we have two definitions of osteoporosis, one of them which will lead to increased bone fragility, and the other one is compromised bone strength. But both of them will lead to one thing. They will lead to increased incidence of and risk of fractures. And these fractures, sometimes they pass unnoticed, like the vertebral fractures, clinical vertebral fractures can pass unnoticed. But sometimes they are very painful, they are disabling, and they impede the quality of the life of the patient and lead to social isolation and depression. If we go by the WHO criteria, they consider now that osteoporosis is among the most 10 important chronic diseases. It's overtaken only by cancer of the lung. Osteoporotic fractures are more frequent because we live, longer, we live longer than before, life expectancy is increasing, especially in developed countries, and the hospital beds occupied by osteoporotic patients is higher due to fractures, and as I said, it impairs the quality of life of the patient, leading to social isolation. Still, we have many obstacles. This disease is silent, and some fractures, as I mentioned, can go unnoticed. We have an insufficient rate of diagnosis and treatment because sometimes we screen the wrong patients and we leave the patients who need treatment. The global challenge to persistence of therapy is in chronic diseases leads to bad compliance. Adherence to therapy is very low and persistence over time is very low. Compliance in our area here for the first year of treatment it can be up to 50%, but in Egypt, it's much less than that because the problem that we don't tell our patients or some people don't tell the patients how long they should go on the treatment. So the patients take matters into their hands, and after taking the drug for three or four months, they stop it. You can see the osteocytes are very abundant in the bone matrix. They are connected together by intercanaliculi, and when they have a signal from any traumatized bone which need to be resolved, it will go to the osteocyte. The osteocyte will send a signal to the osteoclasts to start multiplication and replication, and it will start resolving the bone at that site. Now, the osteocytes has many cytokines through which it can exert its action. One of them is capsaicin K, and one of them is sclerostin. And now they are concentrating on what cytokines the osteocytes are producing to come up with new drugs. So we have very effective treatments, but the most, thing, the most important thing, we have to identify the appropriate patient to treat, which patient should we treat, select among these treatment options, and to use the drugs in the most effective way to get the best outcome. Two questions arise here. Is chronic administration of these drugs essential? Should we continue on the drugs for a long time? 
The other thing is chronic administration safe. I'm going through very quickly through these studies. Alan Dornane, they have, we have data for 10 years now from the FIT original study, which extended for another 10 years. Instead of four, they went to 10 years, and it showed there is an increase in the BMD of the hip and of the spine. And the other drug is donate, and these are seven years data, which showed that there is an increase in the BMD over seven years in the lumbar spine. But when the drug was stopped, the BMD declined very quickly. And this means that those patients need to have the drug for longer periods of time. And then we have the strontium ranilate, which we had studied for almost 10 years. This is the drug which will have a dual acting drugs, both uh, 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 acting on uncoupling of osteoplast and osteoblast. And after five years, there was a BMD increase in all the three measured sites. The intravenous bisphosphonate, which is zoledronic acid. They had a study where they gave the patient the drug for three years, and they continued for another six years, and there is an added value here of almost 1.74% increase in the BMD. PTH, it has a, over 18 months it has been given because more than that, it has proved to cause osteosarcoma in animal models, and this is why we use it for 18 months only in humans but with glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis, we can use it up to three years, which is 36 months, compared to alendronate, but the FDA did not approve it for three years. They approved it only for two years in glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis. And this is the biologic drug, which we talk about, is dizonimab, which anti-rank ligand, and this will prevent the maturation of the osteoclast to start the resorption procedure and we had data for almost five years with the Freedom Study. Now the other question, is chronic administration safe? In rheumatology, we have a say. There is no gain without pain. But we are very much concerned about bisphosphonates and osteoporosis because we don't know what is the half-life of bisphosphonates. Bisphosphonates are bone-seeking drugs. They go straight away to the bone and they lie underneath the osteoclasts. And when the osteoclast starts to function, they are liberated, and they will start inhibiting the osteoclastic action. But this is why they have a very limited degradation. And this is why when we stop it, we can still get a beneficial effect for several years after stopping the drug. But the question we don't have an answer, which patient will benefit from this, and which patient will have a recurrence of his disease. And this is where bisphosphonates will lie. We have, the sorry, we have the resting phase, and with this resting phase, there is initiation of resorption, the resorption by the osteoclasts, and then we have the reversal phase, bone formation by the osteoblast, and this is what we call a remodeling cycle. And this remodeling cycle starts after the age of 30, when we start losing bone by the rate of 1% every year, but unfortunately, females, when they go after monopause, they start losing 5% every year. Excessive bone remodeling can be a contributing factor to fractures and osteoporosis, and this is how it goes. Because if you start with this, you have a, a bone cycle where there are trabeculae, and it's a healthy bone. With increased bone remodeling, there is structural deterioration, there is increased skeletal fragility and the eventually increased fracture risk. So any minor trauma can cause this. The presentation not so. Now, one of the side effects which dentists are very furious about, rheumatologists or big surgeons using bisphosphonates for the treatment of their patients is osteonecrosis of the Jew. 
Osteonecrosis of the jaw has been noticed, exposed bone in the maxillofacial area. It occurs in association with dental surgery, approximately 75% of the cases. It can occur spontaneously with no evidence of healing. But they found that this osteoarthritis of the jaw occurs in patients with cancer who lack oral hygiene, but some of them occurs in patients taking antiresorbative like bisphosphonates. The other thing which we have noticed that using bisphosphonates for a long time, especially the intravenous one, we have what we call subtocanteric femoral shaft fractures. The patient will complain of mid-thigh pain. And if you do an x-ray for this patient at the beginning, and this is in September 2008, the report was normal. If you take it a little bit further, in May 2009, you can see the, the thickening of the cortex here, which is the note that there was a stress fracture which would have healed. If you take it a step further and do a CT, you can see that there is callus formation here. So a typical fractures can occur secondary to bisphosphonates. But the risk of atypical fractures is eight per 10,000 patients. The number needed to treat for three years to prevent a hip fracture is 91 patients. To prevent a radiographic vertebral fracture is 14 patients. But the number needed to harm within three years is almost 417 patients, which is a high number. And for each stress fracture, you have prevented at least 30 vertebral fractures and five hip fractures. Now the other part, the second part of my presentation, what, what happens when we discontinue treatment? And the only things we have to measure is the bone mineral density and the bone turnover markers. And the other thing we assess when we stop treatment, what is the effect on a subsequent fracture? With estrogen, there is a rapid decline in the BMD. Short hormone therapy has been reported does not protect from bone loss. There is a bone loss even after one to two years of discontinuation. There is love, rapid loss of bone. The Framingham, the Framingham study has shown that after seven years of estrogen therapy, there was very little residual effect on bone density 10 to 20 years after estrogen was thrown. Bisphosphonates, this is a very clinical and critical area. Significant differences in the bisphosphonates, the BMD and BTM, which are the bone turnover markers, followed discontinuation of therapy. One year, if you give a patient with osteopenia, zoledronic acid, which is the intravenous bisphosphonate, this can persist its action for at least five years, three years. But mind you, this is a case of osteopenia, not osteoporosis. In case with an osteoporotic patient, alendronate for at least five years results in a greater persistence of two years after therapy. This continuation of rosidronate is followed by rapid decline, especially after three years. What about ralixofen, which is the selective estrogen receptor modulator? It is short-lived its effect on the bone after cessation of treatment. The bone turnover response was lost six months after treatment was discontinued even if the patient was taking two years of therapy. The hip BMD was 2% less than the baseline. And this study showed that five years of treatment with zoloxifen did not protect against bone loss one year after withdrawal of the therapy. What about strontium marinolate? With strontium marinolate, after discontinuation, there is an increase in the bone alkaline phosphatase, which is a bone forming indicator with a decrease in the serum CTX, which denotes bone resorption. There's a significant increase in the BMD patients, and this occurred when the patient switched to placebo. There was a decline in the BMD, and when they returned back to the strontium lead, the BMD increased. The BMD in the placebo group increased after switch to the strontium lead. With the denosumab, cessation of therapy led to decrease in the serum tolipeptide within nine months is followed by a compensatory overshoot. So at the first stage, there was loss of bone and then it returned it back to normal by 30 months after stopping desinumab. The BMD returned to baseline within 18 months from stopping the drug. With PTH, the data are collected after 18 months of the period allowed for treatment. The BMD of the 
total hip and lumbar spine was maintained, although some patients have been given alandronate, and this was followed in 47% of the patients. The use of the bisphosphonate was associated with a greater maintenance of BMD gains than as those who did not use osteoporosis drugs. Now there is a growing trend now of combining PTH teriparatide with desinumab. And I have three patients who might be giving the two because they found out that it potentiates the action of each other and it leads to more increase in the BMD. What is the effect on fractures? If you give the patient on hormone therapy five years of estrogen therapy, it's needed to reduce a minimum, needed to reduce a fracture risk. But within the five years, he can develop, she can develop many other things. For example, coronary artery disease, she can develop stroke, she can develop cancer breast. The Women Health Initiative noted that 30% reduction in fractures in healthy postmenopausal women who have been treated for an average of five to seven years, which is a long time. The FDA no longer recommends estrogen therapy for the treatment of osteoporosis. With bisphosphonates, it's needed a minimum of two to three years, but sometimes it is needed more for three to five years because those patients, they had a lower incidence of fracture when they continued for three to five years. With alendorinate, the treatment group obtained later radiographs of the spine at the end of 10 years, and there was no evidence of increased rate of morphometric vertebral fractures. With resodonate, in the vertebral North America study, though there was decline in the BMD and decrease in the bone turnover markers, the one year of the donut group, the incidence of new morphometric vertebral fractures was decreased by 46%. So it's a minimum of three to five years which we give bisphosphonates. With the duronic acid, it had been shown that giving the drug for more than three years, up to six years, has an edge. The very reported differences in the rate of clinical vertebral hip and non-vertebral fractures between three and six years. With the raloxifen, the data, you can give the drug as much as you like because the eight years data had no significant change in the fracture data and no significant reduction in the hip fracture risk compared to placebo. With the strontium nalinate, they mainly were concerned about safety of the drug. They were not concerned about what happens to the patients after stopping for five years. But three months after stopping, there was a rapid decrease of bone alkaline fertilities and an increase in the CRMCTX. And they, by this, they achieved what they were looking for as a primary endpoint that the bones get rid of its storage of strontium nanolate within three months after stopping the treatment. With the desinumab, it's given every six months. So subcutaneously, it was associated with the reduction of vertebral, non-vertebral, and hip fractures. Six years of continuous treatment was associated increased, gradual increase in the BMD. We have no larger studies to clarify fractures after stopping dizinumab, no recommended limit of duration of dizinumab therapy. With the teriparatide, we are committed only to 18 months of therapy. And the findings of osteosarcoma in the PTH-treated fissure rats indicated that this finding was likely to predict what happens in uh, the uh, 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 animals, which is osteosarcoma, but does not necessarily uh, give the same impression that it can happen in human beings. They concluded that increased duration resulted in a progressive decrease in the rate of non-vertebral fragile fractures and back pain. It team months is following uh, 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 stopping the drug, though some patients were giving bisphosphonate, they claim that uh, based on logistic regression analysis, there is still an increase in the BMD. Further efficacy and safety data, as I mentioned, are uh, uh, based on the 36 months duration of therapy given in the States, but the FDA did not approve it. Currently, I'm using it in my patients for two years. We have glucocorticoid-induced osteoporosis. How long to treat? With every individual fracture, you need to categorize the patients into three groups. This is an algorithm which was developed by the American College of Rheumatology. Low fracture risk, intermediate fracture risk, and high fracture risk. This is an algorithm based on clinical assessment, fracture history, age, BMD, 
FRAX, which is a computerized algorithm predicting fractures within the next 10 years in a patient, and deferrality, which means frequent falling. Five years can be a decision point by which you do this. Now, for patients with a low risk of fracture, and this is based on FRAX and clinical assessment, will include many patients originally started therapy to prevent osteoporosis. Bisphosphonates can be stopped until a fracture risk is increased. Rylocliphosphine can be given up between five to 10 years. HRT use the lowest possible dose for short possible time, three to six months if you want to use it. Now for those patients at an intermediate risk of fracture, there are individuals who have no fragility fracture. They are osteopenic, but their FRAX 10 year risk meets the enough guidelines for starting treatment. Bisphosphonates can be used for five years and check oral health and thigh pain for osteonecrosis of the jaw and the atypical femoral fractures. Stop the drug for drug holiday for several years, but check the bone turnover markers every six months and BMD if it declines, resume treatment. Some same applies to strontium, marinolate, and dizinumab. Riloxifen can be given as much as 10 years. Now, for those patients who are at high risk of developing a fracture, those patients have a prior fragility fracture. FRAX 10 year for fractures exceeds the guidelines for treatment of very low BMD, minus 3.0 and less without prior fracture. Bisphosphonates can be used at least for, seven year, for 10 years with regular checkup of oral health as well as thigh pain. If no prior teriparatide therapy or contraindications, consider switching to the two years of teriparatide for drug holiday from bisphosphonates and then resume bisphosphonates. Check the bone turnover markers every six months, BMD yearly, and resume treatment if there is a decline. For those patients, continue on the drug therapy monitoring oral health and thigh pain. Strontium marinolate, monitor for DVT. Desonimab, monitor for osteonecrosis of the jaw and the atypical femoral fracture. Teriparatide for two years, followed by strontium marinolate or dizinumab. But don't use teriparatide in a patient who had cancer or had a family history of cancer. Now, what happens if a subtocanteric fracture occurs? First, you have to stop the bisphosphonates, evaluate for stress reaction on the other side because the other side is likely to fracture later on. Consider teriparatide for two years and subsequently use strontium marinate or dizinumab. How long to treat? If we go for the HRT, as short as possible. Bisphosphonates, controversial, three to five, seven to 10 years. Relaxifen, no limitation. Teriparatide, 18 months. Glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis, 24 months. Strontium marinolate, at least for five years. Desinomab, three to five years. Still, we have very unmet needs and very many questions which are not answered. What is the optimal duration of treatment in achieving fracture reduction and avoiding side effects at the same time due to its cumulative effect? What effect does a holiday mean? And does this mean reduction of the risk of side effects? Does the resumption of treatment after a holiday resume the risk? Does a change from an anti-resorbative to another anabolic agent reset the cumulative risk of anti-resorbative agent back to baseline? Does that change in the mechanism of anti-resorbative treatment it change the cumulative effect? Ladies and gentlemen, we have to make the first fracture, the last fracture, and we have to make it history. And the whole idea of knowing how long to treat is to convey the message, the message to our patients and give them the choice and let, us, let them share with us what is the best drug for them because without their compliance, there will be failure of treatment and fractures will occur. Thank you very much.